Okay, um, I'd just like to welcome you to this webinar series, which you might know is called Post Philosophies and the Doing of Inquiry. And we are already on the eighth of the series, which means that we more than halfway through it. And we've really been, been enjoying um, interviewing and speaking to a range of scholars that we've had thus far. So as you, as you might also know, it's a free webinar series with um, 14 sessions in total, and we meet monthly on the topic of post-qualitative inquiry and the doing of inquiry, inspired by a large range of post-philosophies. And each session involves one or two international guests who have experience with inquiry approaches inspired by post-philosophies such as post-humanism, post-structuralism, affect theories, feminist new materialism and post-colonialism. Um, my name is Vivian Bozalek and I'm co-hosting this webinar with Candice Kuby. The webinar series is made possible by a collaborative partnership between our universities, which are the University of Missouri system and the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. The partnership in our university started a long time ago in 1986. Um, and the funding for this series comes from the University of Missouri South African Education Program Committee, which supports academic exchanges, which Candice and I have um, been on, and the opportunities for teaching and, and learning, research, community engagement um, between our two universities. So we're very grateful to our university's long-time collaboration and their support of this webinar series. Um, these webinars are also available on YouTube, which is quite useful if, you, if people can't attend them. And you can find them on the website if you'd like to access them. And you can also subscribe to the YouTube series. Um, there's also, as you might know, the, the option for closed captioning to see the written transcript of the webinar. Um, we also are very pleased that we, these webinar series are going to become two special issues in qualitative inquiry. So over time, the panelists that we have are, are in conversation with will publish their webinar in article format, and we'll we'll keep you updated about that. Shit. Sorry, something happened. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The, the whole thing just uh, collapsed. Um, we, I, I believe now that the US has moved into daylight saving just recently. So the time has changed for us. It's no longer 5.30, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm not sure if the time changes for you at all, but we have updated it on the, the website so you can uh, be apprised of it there. Today, our panelist is Dr. Aaron Kunz, who's a professor of research methodology and the departmental chair at Florida International University. And he currently holds the Frost Professorship of Education and Human Development. Welcome, Aaron. Great, thanks. And we're also very pleased to have his former student, Michelle Wooten. Welcome, Michelle. We're very pleased to have you here. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks for that introduction, um, Viv. So I also would like to introduce the other Aaron we have on our screen today, Aaron Price. Um, Aaron Price is a doctoral student with me here at the University of Missouri. She is helping out tremendously to make this webinar series possible. Um, she does our video editing to get things up on YouTube. She's provided the beautiful artwork um, that we see on the website and our promotional materials. Erin um, is an artist and an art educator with experience coordinating preschool through secondary art education and US public schools. Um, she's interested in the role of material invitations, affect and artistic encounters and the becoming of identity and community. So thank you, Erin, for um, your artistic um, um, creativity and um, making the webinar series come alive in color 
um, with your art that you shared with us for the website and for all of your technical support during the webinar today, as well as getting our videos out there for people to be able to watch them later. We really appreciate um, all that you're doing to make this webinar series possible. Thank you. Now to introduce our two co-hosts, Vivian Bozilek is an Emerita Professor in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of the Western Cape, South Africa. She's also an honorary professor in the Center for Higher Education Research, Teaching and Learning at Rhodes University. She holds a PhD from Utrecht University and her research interests and publications include the political ethics of care and social justice, post-humanism and feminist new materialism, and innovative scholarly practices in higher education. Her most recent co-edited books include Post-Humanism and Political Care Ethics for Reconfiguring Higher Education and Post-Anthropocentric Social Work, Critical Post-Humanism, excuse me, Critical Post-Human and New Materialist Perspective. Dr. Candace Kuby is an Associate Professor of Teaching, Learning, Teaching and Curriculum at the University of Missouri. She's also our Department Chair and the Director of Qualitative Inquiry. Dr. Kuby's research interests are the coming to be of literacy when young children work with artistic and digital tools and approaches to and pedagogies of qualitative inquiry when thinking with post-structural and post-humanist philosophies. She is also the author or co-author of several books, including Speculative Pedagogies of Qualitative Inquiry, Post-Humanism and Literacy Education, Knowing, Becoming, Doing Literacy. And her scholarship appears in in journals including Qualitative Inquiry, Journal of Early Childhood Literacy, and the Journal of Literacy Research. I'm just so thankful, and I know that we all are, for making this space and, and bringing together this incredible list of panelists for us to have this session. Thanks, Erin. I'm just going to um, speak a little bit about the platform we're using and what's going to happen in this session. So you might have noticed that we're using a Zoom webinar platform, not a meeting platform, so that we are allowing a large number of people to attend. Because of this, only the hosts and panelists have the video and audio functions. Um, as we did mention already, we, we're recording this webinar for public viewing later on YouTube. It takes a couple of weeks for the YouTube to come up. The chat function is for you, open for you to connect with other attendees during the webinar. But we, we ask that if you have any questions that you go through the Q&A button, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. So this makes it easier for Erin and I to moderate the questions. So we're not scrolling through the chat and the QA function. So just please do take a moment to locate the button if you don't know where it is. So this is what's gonna happen during the webinar. For the first 30 to 40 minutes, Candice will interview Aaron on the four main questions, which if you've attended before, you've probably heard, which it's our common thread that we're using for these uh, webinars. And you can also find them on our webpage. Um, Aaron might share examples from his scholarship and we've, we've had suggested readings of Aaron's on our website, which hopefully some of you will have been able to, to get to. Then Candice will spend some time asking Aaron how he mentors and teaches graduate students while they engage in post philosophies and the doing of inquiry. We've also asked panelists to invite current or former students to dialogue with us for 10 to 20 minutes on teaching, learning, advising, and mentoring relationships, and engaging in post philosophies and doing of inquiry. Erin's former student, Michelle, um, and you also have very interesting publications, which I looked at, Michelle, mm -hmm. will join us for this portion. So we want this webinar series to open up spaces for conversations that aren't often discussed publicly on how to negotiate inquiry and in, in academia, especially from post philosophies perspective. After that, we'll have a, a session where we invite attendees to ask questions, both to Aaron and Michelle. And we hope to have about 30 minutes for that. So please um, jot down questions that you want to ask. And um, you know when you're ready, put them in the Q&A portion. Um, 
So we, as I said, we're going to moderate them in the Q and A se section, and we we try and get through as many questions as possible. I'm going to hand over now to Candice. All right, thanks so much, Viv and Erin, for those introductions. Um, we're going to start and jump in. I want to give a little bit more information about Dr. Erin Kuntz um, as a way of introducing and welcoming you, and then we'll jump into our four questions. So as we mentioned before, Dr. Kuntz is a professor of research and methodology and the department chair at Florida International University. His research focuses on developing materialist methodologies or ways of producing knowledge that take seriously the theoretical deliberations of relational materialism and post-structuralism that have emerged in social theory over the past 50 years. He grounds his work in empirical questions about the production of inquiry in the K-16 arena, faculty work in activism in post-secondary institutions, and the impact of the built environment on learning. Dr. Kuntz has numerous publications in a, a variety of journals. He also has um, several books. He's co-authored a few books, such as Qualitative Inquiry for Equity in Higher Education, Methodological Implications, Negotiations, and Responsibilities, Leading Dynamic Schools, Implementing Ethical Education Policy, and Citizenship Education, Global Perspectives, Local Practices. In 2015, Dr. Kuntz published his first solo authored book, The Responsible Methodologist, Inquiry, Truth-Telling, and Social Justice. And it was selected as an honorable mention for the 2017 AERA Qual Research SIG Book Award. And most recently, um, which is one of our suggested readings for the webinar today, comes um, as a chapter out of this next book, Qualitative Inquiry, Cartography and the Promise of Material Change. It was awarded the 2020 Outstanding Book Award from the Qualitative Research SIG at AERA. So we are so pleased that you could join us today, Erin. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I was trying to remember back when I first met you, um, I think it was probably at an International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry Conference um, where we were at a dinner together and shared several meals and had lots of, um, lots of uh, I would say, good memories with colleagues there. Um, I will also say two of your books have been instrumental um, in the classes that I teach. And so for many years, I had read your work before I met you in person. Um, and so I'm just so excited that we can have this conversation today. So thanks for making time and joining us. Well, thank you. And thanks for the nice introduction. That was lovely. So we'll jump into our first question. Um, the first question that we're asking all of our panelists is how does your philosophical approach influence your ways of doing inquiry? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, a great and important question. So I, in, I hope, uh, foreground in my own work, a uh, philosophical orientation that begins uh, with an eth ethical orientation to the world. And um, I thought in answering this, I should just give a little piece of smidgen of my background as it sort of oriented me to this. Um, so my master's is actually in English literature. My doctorate's in education, my master's in English literature. And um, uh, I went through, uh, I was at Northeastern University and it was great and I call it my wonderful indoctrination uh, because uh, when I started at Northeastern, they uh, kind of said, uh, it, one of the professors said, you know, we're gonna read Foucault and everything in relation to Foucault. And that was, I was there to read literature. That, uh, that was my two years. <laughs> I was reading Foucault and everything in relation to Foucault. And it was really an amazing experience uh, in many wonderful ways. Um, not to date myself, but this was, you know, Boston in the early 90s. So, we're, you know, there, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Judith Butler speak and Cornel West and reading all this. But at the end of the two year program, <clears throat> I was kind of really disenchanted with higher education. So I left. I, um, uh, I felt like it was divorced from uh, the human condition. <laughs> I felt like it was divorced from my dailiness. Um, and so I say this because this started an important in, in important ways to inform my sort of ethical orientation in the world, I, I just didn't see the connection um, uh, with a lot of the theory we were reading um, to, to my everyday life. So I went and worked for five years um, uh, in academia and, 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 and tried to sort of make ends meet. And then I went back to UMass Amherst uh, for my doctorate. And there I sort of fell in with, um, um, I was in the, the School of Education, but I took many, many courses in gender and sociology uh, with Joy Misra and then uh, with Marx in Marxist economics uh, with Rick Wolf. 
And it was there that I really started to see this sort of idea that, you know, um, uh, philosophy is and should be about an ontological engagement with the world. It's about a way of being or becoming. Um, and what I wanted to start working through is this idea of it as, as, as an ethical enactment that we, we need to change this world. <laughs> um, so we ourselves need to, need to act differently and engage differently. And it's not just a, well, it is a philosophical um, orientation, but that in and of itself is material. So I got very interested in materialism. Um, and that sort of synced up as I graduated from UMass and then uh, started my sort of uh, scholarly trajectory in, in the faculty world with this new materialism or, or what I'm, I kind of term relational materialism that came out. And I got really <clears throat> interested in um, issues of geography, critical geography uh, or cultural geography. Um, and that linked quite nicely, I think, with a lot of the work that was coming out, um, like Rosie Bredotti's work on cartography uh, and uh, affirmative ethics that just really struck a chord with me. So I kind of begin there um, in terms of how I engage philosophically. And I know we're gonna talk later on about how that shifts and relates to my notions of methodology, but um, um, this is an important sort of uh, way of living for me. And, you know, we look around, the world or we live within this world um, and it's easy I think and perhaps even appropriate to be overwhelmed with the amount of injustice that we are witnessing all the time. I don't know if it's made the papers abroad but we've had we have tragedy after tragedy after tragedy in my country um, right now that is hooked up with the legacy um, of xenophobia, a legacy of uh, white supremacy, a legacy of so many things that um, uh, I think at the time at times can feel like whew I just gotta take a breath, right? Uh, from my perspective and where I'm oriented, being able to take that breath and step back is an enormous privilege, right? Not everybody gets to take a breath. So I try to take, take my privileges seriously. Um, and I think that, you know, um, uh, I begin with ethics. And, I, and if you begin with ethics, then it begins with how do you act within the world? And how can you, I think we have an ethical obligation to imagine a different world. We need, to op we need to imagine a, a, a potential that has not yet existed. So then the question becomes, how do you do that, right? And I think that's where a lot of my work has sort of moved through. Um, I, uh, I try to maintain a connection to materialism <clears throat> because I think that that's really important. You know, in my training from Foucault to then reading kind of like the neo-Marxists, um, Althusser and then uh, others later, um, uh, Rick Wolf, who was influenced well on me, uh, really kept hammering home, what are we doing on an everyday basis, which brought me to a real interest in the mundane. You know, I think we, I, um, when I write about, uh, I got interested in this idea of Cartesia and truth telling, not in an overarching sense. I mean, it's important when we have the big examples of, of truth telling that make the news and the like, but I'm very much interested in what are we doing as a daily practice? So when I talk about activism or research, uh, academic activism, I wanna, know, I wanna consider activism as a daily practice and the ontological engagement with the world. Um, and so that all of those things shift and change how, how I consider what we can do and what we might become and how we might become differently. Um, it links back, I think, to uh, the philosophical work of uh, mapping, you know? And I think, you know, uh, Foucault talks about it as a, a creating a history of the present, which I think is a really interesting and hard. <laughs> I want to also bring it back, it's not easy. But if we understand a history of the present, we're dealing with an imminent context, things that are in creation right now. Um, and if they're imminent, that means that they can change doesn't mean that they always do. It means that they can. And so I really wanna believe uh, in this notion of potential, that there's, there's, there's something, uh, the world is not fully determined yet. There's change that can happen. Uh, and I also wanna believe that we have a responsibility to invoke a different type of change. Um, and so that kind of, all of that orients me. I know I just you know, put a lot out there, but all of that kind of orients me in my work um, it is, it is a, um, uh, I can share lots of examples of how this sort of trickles down in very kind of mundane ways. It is, a, it is an orientation for me such that 
when I'm writing, I hope that the way that I write and the way that I read um, changes my engagement with the world. I, I know that it does. I know that my reading of, of, of philosophies, both you know what we might term post and not, changes me. And uh, I'm very affected by it. You know, I can't, I can't help that. Um, and so I think I have an ethical uh, obligation to sort of take those changes seriously and to think through how they impact my daily practice. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciated kind of the backstory of, of how you got to kind of where you are now and the forefront of ethics. Um, as I was reading through your suggested readings, um, especially chapter five, which is out of your new book, I believe, there's yeah. a couple of quotes that I think connect to what you were just talking about. So I'm going to read a couple of quotes to you and see if you can expand a little bit more, especially in relation to what you were just talking about, about um, the mundane everyday um, justice and kind of the ethics around doing this work. So in chapter five, you um, talk a little bit here, you talk about negative critique yeah. in the chapter. Um, and you say that activities often exercised in critical inquiry with the hope of challenging the status quo, yet as previously noted in the chapter, dangerously lead to moments of social paralysis as yeah. though there is too much to do, but nowhere to go productively. Um, and then you continue a little bit further. You talk about um, we are all in relation all of the time. Um, and uh, consequently, we are all responsible all of the time, like we're in this together. Um, and then you end that chapter on the, on the final page talking about um, political power. And you say, thus it is that those of us who emphasize the political power of relational inquiry to make possible social change would do well to accept Bradati's challenge to drop our historical adherence to the habits of dialectical thinking and negative critique to reorient to the potential inherent in affirmation, itself a necessarily creative and experimental practice of inquiry. So you, you talk in this chapter a good bit about negative critique and then you talk about creative critique and how this is all relational and, and power. Um, so I was really struck by that chapter and especially thinking like you said, like in our country, um, a lot of the injustices and in our history and legacy um, and often feeling stuck in critique. Um, and so, you know, people often will say Bruno Latour talks about what is critique gotten us, it's run out of steam, et cetera. So I guess help us, you know, talk a little bit more about how these philosophies that you draw upon um, kind of shape your view of the world and your way of being in the world. And what does that have to offer um, those who might be listening? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so let me begin by saying, I'm, as many people are, I'm against relativism, right? The anything goes approach. We, I have no time for that that um, uh, any position is simply relativistic. No, because what happens out of that can happen a type of paralysis that, you, that was part of that quote that you were rendering um, uh, to us, which is that if anything goes and everything goes, what are the ethics that we stand on, right? We, are, we instead need to be positioned. No, anything does not go. Right, and I wanted uh, you know I want to begin with that sort of premise. We you know, and this is is a part of my sort of I guess sort of social justice foundation that we we um, have a responsibility to to um, speak and engage with injustice. Um, the the problem, the difficulty that happens with negative critique is it can also often lead to this, this idea of paralysis, which is you can't move in any direction because any direction you go is, is susceptible to additional critique, right? Um, when I work with students, when I work with colleagues, you know, if you go to a conference presentation or you're at a dissertation defense, the worst comments are, I call them the yeah, but comments. Yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about that? Yeah, but what about this, right? There's some like innumerable responses to anything and every claim we can make. I get that, but we need to have entry points. We, and and uh, you know this is a particularly important to me. Um, you, we need to sort of say this is where I begin. So, for instance, in my and this is I, I'm a part of some ways of my academic training. I often begin with class analysis. My entry point into into sort of social relations or material relations is foregrounds class relations. And those are the things that I begin by mapping. Is that the only thing I look at? No, but that's my entry point, right? So um, uh, I think you know it, it's easy 
as, as we've been talking, there's so much going on in the world where, where we should be aware of so much. There's so much injustice that we can start to think like there's too much. I, mean, I just can't do it all. And you're right, you can't do it all. So you locate an entry point into it. Where, what is your slice of entry point? And you learn about others. And this is, you know, we've heard this critique as well about new materialism, right? What's so new about new materialism? Indigenous, you know, folks have been dealing and thinking in these ways for centuries. Um, so we have to learn those histories. We have to, we have to um, sometimes be quiet and listen to those types of things that are happening. Even as we have a reason, we don't get to opt out of having a position. Right, we just, I can't, I, and, and I will say that I, I learned this uh, in many ways the hard way where I was called out for sitting on the fence. Like I, I used to be really, maybe I still am, really good at sitting politically on the fence. And when I took time off to work, you know, I worked as um, electrician's apprentice for a while. It was the electricians that were like, you know, we would be having lunch and they'd have political conversations and, I'd be, and I was, you know, I had gone through schooling and I was really good at saying, well, there's this point over here. I would point to issues. There's this issue and there's this issue and there's this issue. And they would be like, why are you gonna come down off the fence and take a stand? What do you think? We have no idea. We've had lunch with you for like a year. I have no idea where you stand about anything, right? And then it happened again when I went to grad school, you know, and, and, and in classes, people, I think rightly sort of called me out by saying, you can't, you keep taking a non-position, right? You keep sort of moving to sort of point. And I think, Negative critique, this is the, you know, can, can, can contribute to that. Negative critique is this movement to sort of say, like, I'm going to cut down an argument, or I'm going to find a contradiction in an argument. And as a result, that entire position crumbles and is of no use, right? But we can love and live with imperfect things, right? This is the very basic notion of contradiction. The contradiction can happen and can maintain intention. We do it every day. And so as a result, we might shift to affirmative critique, which is this is coming from you know, a Deleuzian or a Bredadian approach where you know, critique is creative, it makes something new possible. So when I talked earlier about cartography or um, I talked about this notion of mapping, to, from my perspective, how I'm trying to understand mapping is not, uh, is not a, 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 an activity of capture. It's not trying to capture or represent what is there. It's trying to create something new so that the, you, you map the present in order to try to find the cracks and the fissures, the contradictions that make possible a future that was unknown to me because I hadn't mapped yet, right? If that makes sense. And it's a way of making sense of the world that we're in. Um, uh, so that I think is a is a really really important element of sort of where I come from, and it give, does give me a degree of hope, even as it you know it can be, give me a degree of exhaustion, like many folks feel, even as one can be overwhelmed. But I don't I don't think that I get to opt out of this process. I think that uh, for me, opting out of that process, given all that I represent, you know, sort of sitting here as a white male, right, heterosexual. It put all those things in there, all the privileges, right? Opting out is too easy for me, right? And, I, and when I opt out, I invoke all those privileges for which I should be uncomfortable, right? So um, as, as a result, I, I choose to understand us as relational. And so if I understand us as relational, that actually increases my responsibility, right? What's happening, uh, what happened in Atlanta um, with the murder of um, uh, people from uh, uh, Asian communities that is an expression of xenophobia and supremacy in all different areas. Um, I don't get to say that's not me. I don't get to say that I'm, I'm, I'm not a part of a process that makes that possible, right? If I'm uh, doing a class critique, I can critique capitalism all I want. I still am engaging in capitalistic practices. Okay, knowing that, now what? And I think that once we understand ourselves relationally, once we start thinking through um, uh, material relations and take them very seriously, it creates a new level of responsibility with which we need to engage and it creates new possibilities for us, right? And in that sense, I, I, I am taken by Bredati and others sort of um, uh, passion for, I think she calls it like, um, uh, conceptual creativity or the you know c conceptual cr courageousness right to create something new conceptually is is an amazing thing and so you know as some, as some 
for, as someone who was in education also, I understand public education as a sort of very radical idea um, that is not always expressed radically, but the idea that we can have a public education um, and there is incredible potential there that I'm not willing to get, give up or I don't want to invoke the privilege of giving up. Um, this is why I'm in education. This is why you know, I'm housed within um, a school of education. And so, you know, those things come together. And I think that that speaks to why I want to begin with ethics, right? I want to begin with ethical questions. And all of that comes in a sort of relational way of being or relational way of knowing to inform an ethical stance that says, yeah, I'm positioned, yeah, I'm oriented, yeah, I take responsibility for that. And I can't stop there. Right. I think, you know, the, the chapter previous to that one that you were referencing, I, I, I say, you know, I've had I've sat in classes where people will sort of read off a litany of their privileges and then be like, ah, thank God I got that out. Now I feel so much better about myself. Right. But no, you have to then you have to do something right. You have to engage with it. You have to move differently in the world. And, it, and sometimes, like I said, that means being quiet. Sometimes that means engaging. Sometimes that means all these different things um, with the idea that you know, critique creates something. It makes something possible. And the, and the easiest thing for someone to say is, yeah, but you're only critical, right? And I think Foucault calls that as bureaucratic talk, right? When someone says, yeah, all you do is critique, you don't build anything, they're in, in inferring that all you do is negative critique. And I think that affirmative critique built on affirmative ethics can actually be quite empowering and can change how you want to operate within the world. So let's move to question two. I think we're going to keep building on this because I, I hear a thread as I read through your three um, suggested readings, um, but I want to keep us moving through our questions here. So our second one, um, and this is in spirit with wanting a webinar where students and faculty can think together about um, kind of the doing of inquiry. So how does your philosophical approach and the philosophical concepts that you find um, hopeful as you described um, what does it do or what does it make possible or thinkable for, for doing inquiry? Um, and so sometimes students ask me questions about, you know, more traditional practices such as literature reviews or data collection analysis, et cetera. So help us think a little bit, how do you approach the doing of inquiry? Um, what's thinkable or possible with these philosophical concepts that you find hopeful? Yeah, um, so I think um, I, I begin kind of with the premise that you, you can't really critique what you don't know, right? So when I, when, when, for instance, you know, some people will try to infer artificial binaries, right? To say like, well, I'm a qual person, so I'm not really into statistics, right? Or, or then they'll start to make assumptions, grandiose assumptions um, about, you know, sort of um, this, is, this is how quantification shifts the world. Without having, without knowing what that act actually is, without actually going in and looking at, okay, well, how do how how are statistics sort of being articulated within education? What without sort of mapping right statistical uh, positions? So, you know, when I work with students or when I start thinking through, yeah, I think a lit review is really important because you're mapping ideas, you're mapping issues, you're mapping you know um, uh, concepts, and you're you're contextualizing where you are. Um, so I, I, that one to me is kind of like, yeah, you've got to, I'm always a fan of like, we've got to read more and we've got to write more, right? We just, because for me, writing is, is, is like a, um, an incredible act of coming to know. Like, I don't feel like I really know something unless I write through it. And that's just kind of how I operate. So um, I, and, and it animates my life right because i'm often writing about things that i either find annoying in a mundane sense or um, outrageous in the sense of like being put up you know um, engaging with this world in which we live so uh, i think the lit review is is important and i think we need to struggle with method so how do we struggle with method well you don't just throw it out right and you you have to try and engage with it so in my work you know i often use the standard interview as an example um, of uh something i want to kind of problematize but you've got to struggle with it you've got to like have the anxiety of like i'm going to be talking and working with a person and from the very mundane like what if my phone goes off in the middle of an interview and that's embarrassing to like what if what do i do if i have to use the restroom in the middle of whatever right an embodied sense of engagement in the world in order to start trying to problematize larger order questions of what does it mean to represent somebody's subjecthood right via an interview right and so you have the method the interview and what does it mean to really sort of say like i'm going to represent you what does that invoke 
so many things and we need to start getting at it. Even as I'm critical of, you know, in the previous book, I talked about a logic of extraction that maybe method operates so much from extracting from context. We really need to question this and sort of dive back in to an immediacy, right? What it, would it mean to have like an imminent methodological orientation? Um, but I would circle back to like, we got to try it out. We've got to see what works. And I remember Candace, you know, one of the great things that you did is you had a panel at ICQI where people were creating things in, um, in an artistic way, right? In an engagement, right? We need to experiment methodologically. Um, and we need to start, we need to also start thinking when reading people who are challenging these sort of normative processes and in the interest of sort of uh, affirmative critique, not just locating contradiction and saying, well, then it doesn't work, right? Sometimes interviews are really important in sort of a historical record of what's going on and all of these different things we need to sort of challenge them. I also am an advocate of um, ph philosophy as a type of inquiry. Um, and so, you know, I have no, I know we'll talk about this towards the end, but I have no problem with someone doing a conceptual dissertation. And I would read that as an important and a type of sort of um, post-empirical sort of engagement of methodology. I have no problem with that. Um, as long as it's a choice, right, that someone is invoking because they have engaged and they have an understanding of a, a sort of methodological um, uh, or, or a history of methodology. Um, so, and, and, uh, so, and then I think about sort of curricular planning uh, with, with this because students will sometimes get frustrated with the courses that we teach because we'll, we'll take like, imagine like an intro to qualitative research course and we will engage or I will engage with a, a type of like, we might read it like a post-positivist approach um, uh, to inquiry. And then if they continue to take courses with me, I'm circling back and critiquing. And they're like, well, why did they take an entire semester with you? And now you're critiquing that entire semester, right? In the upper level. And then again, it's like, well, right. We need to learn it. We need to work through it. And we need to not just accept it whole scale, right? It's, it, we need to sort of engage with it and imagine other types of possibilities because it's hard to have, to re-invoke great Adi, it's hard to have conceptual courage. If, you're not, if you don't understand what you're being courageous to, <laughs> Or oriented to. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I like this idea of the post. I think this was maybe one of the readings, and I, it's not my own. Patty later referenced it to me, but the post as standing at one's post, as opposed to it being a post uh, in terms of like after something. So if you're standing at one's post, you when you're standing at your post, you're kind of being aware of what's going on around you right? Foucault has this great notion of the vigil, right? When you're standing vigil, it is in a moment before something happens, because you're standing vigil for something to happen. It is an imminent sort of standing at one's post, and you're looking at a landscape that is becoming. It has not yet been determined. So as a result, I like this idea that, okay, so post fall or, or our work now can be standing at our post. You're surveying, right? You're engaged in, in such an idea that you're surveying a landscape. And again, I think Patty said that as an offhand thing and like many things I took it seriously. <laughs> so I was like, this is brilliant. And I talked to her subsequently and she doesn't even remember the conversation. <laughs> and not a very memorable thing for her, but very much for me it was. Um, but this idea like, oh, we're standing at our post, so post structures and you're standing at your post, not to defend, right? We're not defending any sort of, but to engage. And I think that that is a really important element when we start to get to issues at um, literature review. Engage in the literature review, even as we recognize that citation is political, right? Sarah Ahmed is, is really pushed this and people, others have taken it up in really important ways that, you know, we, it, so to write a lit review is not just to cite literature, it is to engage in the notion of citation. Now we need to think ethically, what does that mean? And we need to have these conversations. It's not, you know, a literature, um, other types of activities are not just procedures that we get to extract from, you know, an ethical context. No, what does it mean that why are we citing all these same people over and over again? What does that mean? So that we start to do it with intention um, and take responsibility for those practices. Mm -hmm. So one thing I hear, especially the standing your post and what um, was a thread that came up across the three readings um, for me was really a notion about time and temporality. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like that pops up a lot in your writing. Um, and so you talk a little bit about the immediate now 
um, and the potential of the not yet. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk briefly about um, this notion of time and temporality and maybe this immediate now and how that shapes you actually engaging in, you know, inquiry practices. Yeah, I mean, this is really, this is really hard. <laughs> I think for me, I just would say other people make it look easy, I think. Um, uh, and I know that it's not, but because you're seeing, reading their product. But um, so the immediate now is, is, I think, this challenge of imminence. And it is a challenge for the inquiry, right? How do you sort of orient away from the past and not prescribe the future, right? Because this is, we all have the, the problems, the problematics of prescription, right? I'm not invested in prescription because when you prescribe it, you're saying this is what will happen. I'm not really interested in the shoulds. This is what should happen. Um, uh, that's uh, um, something that comes that uh, has like a moral overtone that I'm not entirely comfortable. But what I am interested in is what might happen. Um, and that's to me about potential. So in order to understand what might happen, you have to, again, survey the immediate now, this sort of uh, element of um, uh, uh, imminence in, that is um, uh, that I think I'm referencing Grey Dottie a lot, I realize it's because <laughs> I've been reading her for a project I'm on right now. Um, I think she talks about it <clears throat> as a closing of, of a history and a, and a becoming of the future, right? The sort of kernel that is um, uh, becoming towards um, uh, something else. You're in this moment right now. And that to me is the challenge of inquiry. How do, you, how do you engage with that um, responsibly? Um, to such an extent that you're not making prescriptions, that, but that you're opening up possibility or potential. Um, and to such an extent that you're critiquing the history uh, that helped to uh, create where we are right now. And so it's the simultaneous critique and pointing towards what might yet become that I think is really important for, for the methodologist. And I think you're right to sort of nail on time and why is that thread there is because for me, it's really hard. <laughs> I am trying to sort of work through it. You know, if um, we make a mistake, I learned this from the critical geographers, um, and particularly Doreen Massey, um, who's uh, got, uh, and who had an incredible work her, um, her book on four time is really important. Who, who started to start thinking through like the politics of geographies, not just as spatial, but as temporal, right? So you can talk, you know, Harvey has this, David Harvey has this notion of time space compression, right? You have, they're struggling with all of this um, because some things endure, some things have duration. And so we have to ask like, why are these things enduring? And are we sort of ethically comfortable with these enduring practices, these enduring things, and maybe we need to nudge them so that they articulate differently. So our third question really connects. So you might feel, well, I'm assuming you'll have a lot more to say, but it, you've already touched on some of this in our third question. So see what else you might want to say. Um, so what are your perspectives on methodology, methodologies and or methods? Um, that's something that comes up a lot from students when I teach about, I'm reading all this post stuff, there seems to be conversations in the field about methods, methodology. Um, so talk a little bit about how you maybe understand or conceptualize that and how that fits with the philosophical um, concepts that you're thinking with. Yeah, I, so um, again, I recall that I'm not for an anything goes approach, right? I'm not, I'm not for relativism, I'm not, but I am for creativity. And for some folks, that means like there's an ongoing debate about what do we do with data? I think an ongoing debate, we see it at ICQI, right? We see it at AERA in the, um, in the in Division D Section 3 or the QualSIG. What, you know, what do we do? Are we producing data? Are we analyzing data? Are we comfortable as this extracted thing? And if not, then, then what do we do? And if, you know, for post-qual, if you see, you know, Betty St. Pierre at ICQI would say, like, it's, it's not a method. So stop trying to create a method for post-qual, right? It, it, it is, not nothing prescriptive about it. It's, to my mind, an ethical orientation. Okay, so if we have that, then, then what do you do? I think we have to experiment. I think you've got to try. And we learn so much from people who do, you know, artistic um, engagements with the world. I'm, I don't consider myself artistically creative at all. So I'm always impressed with folks who are able to sort of engage through various art forms um, because they push us to the limits of both what we know and how, how we live. 
And, you know, I'm, I, just, I love being on the edge of thought. I love being on the edge of kind of becoming. And these artistic folks really do it. And in, in many imaginative ways that, you know, I can't even conceive, even as I think there are many folks who are, are writing philosophical works that are also pushing us towards the edge, that are incredibly um, uh, creative philosophically. Um, Okay, so I, you know, there are people that are doing those type of work. I think we have a responsibility institutionally to make space for that to happen, whether that's in the classes that we are working with, whether that means in the curriculum um, that we're engaging with, or they're advising that we're having, we've got to nudge and we've got to engage. And I think that, you know, sometimes the mistake is, well, go off and figure it out and do it without having any advisement, right? That's not a great feeling in my experience. When I was a student, it wasn't a great feeling when someone just sort of like kicked you off into the sea and you didn't have any orientation. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh, um, <clears throat> uh, what, I can do anything? No, you can't do anything. You have to start, you have to set up your own parameters around it. And that's why I'm of the, I am of kind of um, the mind that you try out some things and often that will mean trying out some kind of traditional practices and, and, and recognizing the discomfort we should have in them. So, you know, it observes standardized notions of observation. It should feel weird, even creepy to sit and observe people and take notes, right? It should not feel normal because it is so closely aligned with elements of surveillance. Right. So when students, when folks, when I work with folks and they're going out and they're doing observations, we come back and we'll talk about what's the difference between observation and surveillance? Like, where did you, where are we slipping here where we should be uncomfortable? Right. What does it mean to do participatory observation? I don't know. Like, let's start you. So we, st we have to start and, and try. And so maybe you're taking field notes in the standardized way, but maybe then you're starting to do creative elements of field notes. You know, maybe you're making analytic memos and you're keeping like, papers on just how you felt during that moment, right? The affect of inquiry, I think is really important. So I think that there's, you know, it should be frustrating, right? It, it's hard, material relations are messy. And we, when we, try, we should be suspect when we try to order them, even as we try to order them <laughs> to make sense of them and engage with them. So I want to bring Michelle in. Um, our fourth question is around kind of what you already started talking about, how we teach, how we mentor. Um, and I love you saying, like, don't just throw people out there. Like, there has to be support and ways of working um, <clears throat> with our students. So I want to do a brief introduction of Michelle and then bring her in with you um, for our fourth question around advice and experiences that you both have with teaching and mentoring. Um, so Michelle, just a brief introduction. Um, Michelle is an education research methodologist focused on transdisciplinary possibilities in academia. She uses post-qualitative inquiry to historicize exclusions generated through normative science teaching and science education research. To further foster transdisciplinarity, Dr. Wooten currently experiments with deliberative dialogue and place-based projects in her teaching of introductory astronomy. So we're so glad that Erin invited you to come today. Um, we hope that the webinar series really opens up spaces for faculty and students to talk together about struggles, um, hopeful, joyful moments, ways that they work together in relationship to both be learners in the academy and to navigate the politics of doing inquiry in the academy. So I'll throw out our fourth question and then you both feel free to chime in and um, and share your thinkings and insights on this question. So the question is about what mechanisms could be put in place um, at a university to help supervisors and or committees support students who are interested in engaging in post-qualitative inquiry. Um, so both of you, if, if Michelle wants to start or Erin, um, talk a little bit about your experiences and recommendations that you might have around this question. Um, okay, thank you. So. One of the first things that I talked about with Aaron when he became my mentor for my dissertation was um, how much time can you give me? Like how often will we meet? Uh, what do you regularly do with your other students? And I, I remember him saying, um, I can meet with you weekly. I can meet with you monthly. I can meet with you um, however often that you need going forward. And there, there can be different phases, like it's different this month versus next month. And I just wanna say that Aaron, that was like a, um, that felt really safe to me and helped me feel like I was, you're gonna help me get where I was going. 
Um, I, I don't know if that's practical for everybody, but I'll just say that that was a nice start. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I my my sense, especially for doc students like Michelle Hood, when she was moving into her dissertation, is I try to take my cues from them, even as I'm like, yeah, I'm, let's meet and let's talk um, uh, about your ideas and the like. It, it, this, Michelle is great because she, I don't know if you think of it this way, but she kind of interviewed me twice, and I and I kind of I I and it seems that I passed, which is great because. Um, uh, she continued working with me. She interviewed me when she was interested in the program um, and, and uh, was, was thinking about um, this big sort of move in, in her life and was considering other programs and, uh, and the like, and then interviewed me again when she was thinking about her dissertation chair. And I, the one thing that, was, that is very impressive, there are many things impressive about the show, that like her own um, uh, activist for herself she's she's she was really invested and in saying like i'm gonna devote this much time i want to know that you're going to devote time to right as and 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 not in an apologetic way but like what's the what are the realities of the, of the, of the situation and i think sometimes we don't have those conversations which is why it was really nice that <laughs> she asked like how much are you really willing to spend um <clears throat> because you know i i try to take teaching seriously or i try to take my role in education kind of seriously. Um, one, because paid to do it, right? So I often would say, Michelle uh, sometimes would, would thank me for stuff and I'd be like, yeah, I'd love to do this. And you realize I actually get paid for this. Like it's not, <laughs> it's right. So like I, I want to honor that type of thing. Um, but she's also an amazingly self-directed person. So like it wasn't, I, in my back of my mind, I wasn't really concerned that she wasn't going to do the work because she was already doing the work. Well, um, may I chime in with another thing that was really neat for doing post-call work. Uh, so after I had gone through the three like qual classes that University of Alabama offers, and I had been on that journey with you in which we as students asked, now like we've, we've learned all these techniques, why are we critiquing them? <laughs> um, like one of those critiques was why I have this, for me was, uh, why have these five chapters? They don't make sense yeah. to me. If like somewhere you're supposed to sit, sit um, stick in your subjectivity statement, um, but shouldn't my subjectivity or my like my encountering with every step of those chapters like be important and relevant and discussed? Um, I I asked Aaron if I could not have the traditional five chapters. And, um, and he said, yes. And so um, at that point, it's been like, how do I organize my dissertation? What makes sense? And it, it took a long time to think through that. Um, one thing that was really nice was all the readings that we had done in those courses, like they inspired me to um, maybe not just get at the jargon of the discipline that I had come to know and love and that had helped me think, but was to think about like talking to my participants. If, if the, I wanted to write this dissertation like to and from the people I was studying, um, how, would, how would they read it and receive it? And so like the first chapter became this overview in which I explored in depth this encounter I had within, with a participant and how it stimulated like the lines of thinking throughout the dissertation. So I just appreciated being to put into motion um, the things I learned in these fall classes into my dissertation. And then I'll just add one more thing about that. Um, a, a clincher for me was that the dissertation doesn't have to end at the end of your doctoral program. Like uh, you may only do part of what you wanted to accomplish and a lot of it can come later. And I'm, I was grateful for that kind of like flexibility and freedom. I, I think one of the things that, you know, the question is kind of what can we do sort of institutionally? The, the problem is, I think there's a problem within our institutional structures, especially, you know, and I don't know enough about sort of um, uh, outside, I'm very sort of US centric in terms of my understanding of the organizational structures of, of the academy. So I want to open that up because, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how it's happening in South Africa or Europe and the like, but when we have these structures in place that end up being like, for lack of a better term, something like academic hazing, like you have to go, through, I went through it, so you have to go through it type thing. And the, dissert, the comps, comprehensive exams, the dissertation proposal and the dissertation can often play that form. 
And so I think one thing we have to do, we have the responsibility to do, and I'm going to try and push it around here where I am now at FIU, it is like we need to rethink what a dissertation is. I mean, it's amazing that we, we work through all this idea of I've just talked about, you know, relational ways of knowing relationality, all of this stuff. And then we expect students to produce a dissertation where they quote, like stand on their own two feet in, in isolation. Why can't we have you know, more engaged and sort of group or relational dissertation projects that are not driven by a sole author, right? Why, why can't we think through different sort of participatory mechanisms um, and what would that look like? Um, I think, and you know, I think that's a real struggle. It, it, it is, you know, I am cognizant of the fact that some people need to finish their degree and get and go on, right? They don't need to be professional students forever. So sometimes you need to sort of invoke those norms in order to get through the institution. But we need to start thinking in more creative ways and challenging uh, folks that would otherwise order this type of knowledge and say, no, you have to do this type of dissertation. Why? Why we know so much about, if we even want to look at data, we know that people learn really well in groups and that isolation of learning is not always the best way to sort of push yourself beyond what you already know. So why do we forget that sometimes in graduate school, right? Why, do, why can't we, could we imagine a comprehensive exam that is a creative expression among multiple people as opposed to a sort of interrogation of one person's knowledge? I think these are the questions that we need to start asking, you know, and maybe it means you have to do something like what Michelle masterfully did in her dissertation where she took chapter one and reframed chapter one. You could still read it kind of as, a, you could find the elements of a traditional chapter one in there, but she's reframing it in a way that is almost a, like delightfully reflexive critique of, of chapter oneness <laughs> as she talks about her encounters with her with participants and what comes out of that re immediate relation. We need to make space, that's, I mean, we need to make space for that. And it's when you have like wonderful students like Michelle that come through that like, start to nudge up, you know, and you're like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Let's, let's think that what this might look like. As I hear both of you talking, I think back to the Standing at One's Post article, Aaron, in the first paragraph or two, you talk about um, inquiry and ethical engagements and inquiry as both exciting and dangerous at the same time. Um, and so I wonder sometimes, you know, especially as students, um, that feeling of, is, is, it, is it dangerous to ask to do otherwise? Like, what could be the the repercussions or what might happen if I do that and how much the relationship with an advisor or, or others is really important and collectively nudging the way that you were describing Michelle nudging you. Um, so I'm curious, we've talked a little bit about dissertations and like working with committees. Um, thoughts if we think more macro and we think more about the academy when it comes to publications, um, when it comes maybe to funding, um, things that um, as faculty and students who might be looking to move into an academic you know, position, um, what are ways that you navigate the exciting and dangerous um, ways of doing inquiry on a, on a larger kind of macro scale in the academy? So Michelle or, or Aaron, thoughts about that? Go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I mean, um... Yeah, it, I mean, this is in many ways the, the kind of like an ultimate question, right? How do we deal with these sort of macro-oriented issues as we um, uh, are trying to provoke some element of change? You know, Michelle's background is is really interesting in relation to this, right? You have Michelle, you have a, a master's in physics, right? Um, and you, and uh, was your BA in mathematics? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So she had a BA in mathematics. So when I was referencing before, like people that are critiquing statistical work that don't know it, like that was not Michelle, right? Or I would talk about diffraction. Do you remember this? The, the, I would it, it, I put up a diffraction, an example of diffraction. We were reading Barad on the um, whiteboard. And I turned and I realized like, sugar on AST, right? I've got someone who has a master's in physics and I've just drawn the most elemental, easy, like superficial notion of diffraction. And, she, and I just turned to her and I was like, is that right? And you're like, Kind of, right? So, so anyways, I, I raise those issues because you have somebody like Michelle's background is so interesting because she has that sort of um, scientific knowledge um, and she's engaged with something that is often critiquing the original, like the normative science. And then reading Barad as both 
someone in physics and as someone who's quite astute in feminist theory and, um, and post, post theory. So when you get to those macro oriented questions, I start thinking through like, okay, so where's the space for that? That, those types of conversations when you're thinking about jobs, right? When you're thinking about like, what is a, what, when we read a job description, what does that look like, right? For if, we, if, if we're advertising for jobs or when Michelle's looking for jobs, right? What, what is it that, that comes out of it? And I think that this is a question of like, kind of in a macro sense, like where's the field going? Right, what is it and, and where do we want to kind of nudge it to go? Um, uh, and, and as a result, these types of hiring practices really matter. Who we're bringing in to teach these things really matter. And we have to be able to have a voice to sort of say like we, these people, the people who deal with philosophy or post um, qual orientations are really pivotal to the field right now. Folks that are engaging with it very seriously and have these different types of background that are, afford oneself a different type of um, uh, engagement with it. So, and I don't know, you know, Michelle, you've had a number of postdocs and I don't know that are not in traditional, tr like they're not in, uh, not in traditionally education places, right? You're teaching physics and you're, you're teaching astronomy and the like. So do you have a sense for how your work in your doctorate has in intersected with those postdocs? I've always been curious. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in my first postdoc, I was um, studying with a, someone who might consider herself more of a cognitive psychologist um, and studying science education. So it was like a big jump to um, think in that way again. And yet um, there's some, been some like really productive thinkings with the mentor about how to maybe combine worlds and um, I'm, I'm excited to see where that work goes. And then my second postdoc mentor um, was is very like friendly. We're actually reading Barad again together right now, <laughs> but he's been really friendly and open. And uh, he echoes a lot of the things that I learned from Aaron. Um, one thing that I still have like seared in my memory from working with Aaron is like, stop asking for permission. <laughs> um, and so, and then I had someone who, as a postdoc mentor who like helped show me how I could do that in my teaching of astronomy. And so um, I've, I've, you know, I've made partnerships between local government and the Sustainability Institute on campus and having my students do projects that I, I was really afraid to do because um, it feels like you're not doing anything that anyone else that teaches astronomy is doing. Like, Traditionally, astronomy is taught as concept after concept, doing math problems, and now you're gonna like do social justice work through um, your class. Like teaching, it just feels like um, very different. Um, but these were, and then um, like other kinds of projects that I do in class are trying to like bring philosophy in and um, have students with differing ideas talk to one another about like, should we really bring humans to Mars? And what's kind of driving that desire for us to get to another planet instead of take care of Earth? Um, and I, I think that those questions should be talked about in introductory science classes because of this post qual work. Like, where else is it going to get talked about? Basically. So I'm wondering, Viv, if you can move us into our question and answer time. Um, and that way we can invite those who are here with us today to also engage in the dialogue with questions. Yeah, thanks, Candice, and thanks to both of you for, for your honesty. It is really fascinating to hear about your relationship and what opened up for you um, in having somebody who could, um, uh, who was giving you permission to do the things that you wanted to do, really. Um, so we're going to move on to questions. I'm not sure if there are any questions yet. Um, I don't see any. Can you see any, Erin? Um, no, but I can think of many. <laughs> okay. Well, then, yeah, maybe we could start with anyone here on the panel who would like to ask questions. I, I'm really fascinated about, because you're an, you know, an astrophysicist, um, and I'm sort of quite keen on Karen Berard myself, the sort of influence that she had both on your dissertation, if she did, 
on your thesis and on your teaching. So I'd just like to ask you quickly about that before we move on. Hey, thanks, Deb. Um, yeah, so in my dissertation, uh, Barad was, was very useful in the thinking about exclusions and how you make choices as a researcher. And that cuts some things from being studied, but enables other things. And mm -hmm. um, she calls it like boundary marking practices. And that's helpful to me and, and was helpful to me in thinking about how research isn't neutral. And as Aaron describes, um, it's an ethical engagement. And therefore it helped me not leave out the fact that I am part of the research process and I'm influencing directions. And I need to talk about that in my writing. Um, and also, was it a strange thing for, for you to do as a scientist coming into oh this? <laughs> this was all strange for me to do. I, I, did, I, uh, I did have a five-year dissertation. And one of those years was just spent reading like Deleuze and Guattari and Foucault and Farad. Yeah, it took a long time to wrap my head Catch around that. Yeah. <laughs> It was very strange. Um, and then, yeah, in, in my teaching, I don't know that I always mark, like I feel like with teaching, sometimes you mark to your students, I'm going in this direction because, um, and then sometimes maybe it's not like the, I find it's not the most productive choice to tell them why you're excluding going in some directions um, because some changes need to happen without like, um, without the, I guess without the fence. I, um, and so when we focused, for example, this semester on non-traditional scientists um, who might be non-binary or not white and male, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on these scientists. Um, I do spend moments describing why it matters, but then I also enable students to talk about why it matters to them. And so, um, so the one little thing I wanted to add was that like, it, I'm not the only one producing knowledge. I am part of the knowledge construction. So I'm inviting others and showing that they matter in how the research or teaching process comes about. Okay, thank you. Erin, did you want to ask something? Sure, so I'm thinking of some of the common themes of questions that we've had throughout the series. And Erin, I wonder if you could speak more to that process of becoming resistive, resistibly imaginative, as you mentioned in your uh, book chapter that you shared. I know you, you shared some of your background, which was wonderful to hear, but for those who are currently in the process, um, I think there's often the self-questioning, which is wonderful, of, of thinking, am I resistive enough? Or <laughs> at what point are my methods good enough? And to not to um, reduce that process, um, could you just speak more to how you came to that orientation of being resistively imaginative? Yeah, I mean, I think of it as in, in relation to sort of um, imagination as a creative exercise, right? I mean, it is, it, it, to to be to imagine something other than we are is really hard. This is why I think actually you know this again to return to sort of the artists of which you are one and know that are able to sort of render um, um, our immediate moment differently than we already know it, right? Or how we would already discern it. So so I think part of that this for me reading philosophy and reading um, different philosophers the theorists um, challenges my imagination because they put me on the edge of my thought in terms of what I, what I believe is possible. And so uh, I, I think imagination allows us to, in some ways, be transgressive. Now, in order to be transgressive, you, you have to work through the limit, whatever the limit is, right? So, um, you know, Foucault talks about uh, transgression as housed within the, within the limit, that the limit always con contains transgressive potential. So that transgressions utilize the limit 
to then produce something new, right? A new imaginative way of being. So in order to do that, you have to understand where the limits are, what they are, and what they do not yet cover. And this is again, kind of about uh, entry points. Um, <clears throat> my worry about education, in particular graduate education, is that it cuts short imaginative possibility, in, especially in education, in my field, right? That it is that um, it, we become enamored with technique and that that technique actually contains knowledge. It doesn't allow it to expand. Um, this is why I'm critical of some many, many methods is that, the, that I'm not interested in programs that produce middle managers kind of for lack of a better term, like procedurists, technocrats. But sometimes I worry that that's where education is going, particularly in the methodological field. So we need to start creating an element of um, uh, creativity within the classes that we teach and within our writings. Um, in, in the, in the, and that means from something like, you know, playing with something very basic, like I think Don Denson in the qualitative inquiry tried to make the actual physical artifact of the journal bigger so people could do more things on the margins, right? I think that there's, so we need to see this from the journal editors. We need to see this from within the field. Um, certainly online publishing has an enormous possibility. Um, uh, however, we often will default to what we already know. So for instance, we often talk about, let me use an example outside of kind of inquiry <clears throat> um, with the pandemic and the like, where there's a lot of serious conversation about what does online learning look like? Well, many faculty try to create a face-to-face -face class in an online environment, right? And I think once you do that, you're kind of dead in the water, You're kind because of, it's not the same. So why are we so unimaginative that we can't, we can't think of a class beyond what happens in the face-to-face? Um, so I think that those are the types of things we need to kind of be suspicious about. And, you know, Michelle's probably heard me say this because students make fun of me because I say it all the time. It, I always say it's not that things are, it's a Foucauldian phrase, it's not that things are right or wrong, it's that they're dangerous. Um, and in that dangerous, they're productive. What people forget about that Foucauldian quote is if you continue with that quote, he says, which means there's always something for us to do. We have to keep you know, if something is dangerous, we have to keep interrogating it, right? We have to understand uh, um, different possibilities. We have to have this conceptual courage, the creative courage that Bredati is bringing forth um, in order to make possible something that is not yet. And that's the beauty, I think, really, of, of life, really. You know, um, I, I think that we need, and that becomes forgotten in our move towards procedurization. Don't, and that saddens me to be frank. I mean, I just, it need not, it need not be that way, but it has for instances of efficiency, I think, for instances of um, uh, capitalistic notions of productivity, all of these different things. Um, but where we might ask ourselves, like where in our education, where are the spaces where we can be imaginative, right? Safely imaginative. Um, and why are there not more of those spaces, right? So, and I think those are the things that we, that we really need to start taking seriously as we work through, you know, a potential yeah. change. There is a question, but I'd just like to follow up on what you've been saying and ask the two of you um, whether you have been able to affect any change in your own institutions. And I mean, you chair of the department now, and can you use that position in any way? To, to make significant changes, at least, you know, where you're working. Excuse the dogs, they're barking. No, <laughs> right? This Deleuze has things to say about dogs, right? <laughs> the bark is the most lonely comment in the universe. But okay, so I hope so. I mean, I, I administration, um, from my experience, this is quite difficult. It's difficult for me because um, I don't often default. I can't, it's not easy for me to default into administrative speak or to engage. Like I, I the meta narrative in my head is always articulated, which has been a problem <laughs> since my youth. But the question of like, you know, so I'm in my first year here. So I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that in, um, I'm able to, one of the things we're, we're doing is building a doctoral degree um, in educational research. And I think this is a place where I can really have an impact administratively that I can nudge towards, like we, need, we want to have these types of classes, which are for my mind, philosophical, imaginative, artistic, et cetera, as part of the everyday curriculum. And that the, um, 
products, for lack of a better term, meaning like dissertations and, and the like artifacts that come out of it could be differently imagined. So those are sort of ongoing. I think it also has to do with hiring practices. Um, it also has to do with what is the work of faculty, which is what I think about all the time. So we are having in departmental meetings, one thing that I'm determined to not happen is that departmental meetings always end up being procedural, right? You could read it in an email, what happens in department meetings. But we're, I, you know, I started this year for good or for ill by saying the world's on fire and we're gonna talk about it in department meetings and we're gonna talk about what it means for our work. And so we tried to deal with issues of diversity, with issues of equity, with issues of social justice in small groups in our departments. How more so than, you know, the problem is we talk about diversity and everyone, um, the easy thing is to say, well, our accreditors require that we have a diversity statement on all our syllabi or something like that, right? Like, that's not what I'm interested in. Like, let's actually engage, what is your work? Um, what is our work collectively as a department? And those are some of the things that I'm trying to sort of push. The other is hiring practices, right? We need to take very seriously who gets in the door of the academy and towards what end. Um, <clears throat> so what does it mean to um, bring someone into your field that is not you, right? Because I think it's, you know, to have a, a, a staff or a um, faculty that or think alike is, is, is not healthy. So, okay, so then how do we sort of think through? So I, I try to have an impact on hiring practices. Where I was also department chair for five years, I think where I was, where I met Michelle at UA, and there I was really pushing for, you know, in a very real sense, um, uh, uh, something like numbers of lines, right? When I started at UA for a while, I was the only person who was doing qual and, and, and you know, when I left, there were three lines. Um, and some of it was kind of, administrate like I'm really good at writing memos now <laughs> which is not something to brag about but <laughs> writing memos to administrators to justify why we need a qual person and maybe saying that they can engage with mixed methods which actually means they're going to be critical of mixed methods right that type of thing sort of creating these little sparks and then the last thing and I'm you know I'll stop because I know I, I'm not known for my brevity but uh creating spaces for 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 faculty and students to feel like they're worth um, something for like better phrasing and in graduate school is really good at making you question yourself academia is in and of itself you are placed in vulnerable positions over and over and over again asked to sort of reveal the product and then have those products judged over and over and over again okay so if we could pause that what if we started thinking about educational processes so we're not getting at products okay so where are the spaces where where, where students are understood as scholars, our students are understood as humans, right? Or where where a, a faculty shift in perspective means that they're taking on a new element of their field, which might mean that their overt productivity goes down, but that's actually a really healthy thing, right? It, 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 one, and I'll stop, but people here take it, have taken it as a bad of, badge of honor to not take sabbaticals. Like I've worked X number of years not taking a sabbatical. No. Everyone should take us, if, if, if you, the, the education, you're not in education to make money, right? Or if so, you're in the wrong field. So, so what does education offer? It can offer you a sabbatical, time to take off and like relax and kind of grow, be fallow for a little bit and read for a semester and mm. then come back. So I really try to push, take this you know, junior faculty, look forward to the sabbatical, take it. If you are a senior faculty member, take a sabbatical, please. We will make it work. And then to try and get folks to sort of, you know, reorient in their field, have the permission to do so. Yeah, I saw that you were advocating that in your chapter. Yeah. yeah. To contemplate, which is very attractive and uh, appeals to the sort of slow scholarship. Yes, yes. Yeah. Michelle, did you want to say anything before we move on to our question? Yes. Uh I'm at the bottom rung of the academic ladder. So I still feel like I'm even learning all the programmatic things that can be done and perturbed and shifted. Uh, but I will say that even so, having reading and writing collaborations where the people who I regularly interact with do want to um, intervene and reimagine education and encourage one another in doing so has been very powerful for me in the past few years. Erin, would you like to ask the question? Sure. 
So we have a question from an individual who also works with critical geography and sees connections, shared trajectories, and resonances with post-humanism and new materialism and their attendant ethics. So could you say more about the connections or trajectories for you um, and how, how they develop? Between, yeah, between critical geography and post-philosophy, post-recall? Um, yeah. 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 Okay, sure, absolutely. I mean, I think my, I don't know if this will come to fruition and I'm open to whoever put this down to collaboration, but I think my next book is gonna deal very specifically with critical geography in relation to post qual or in relation to relational materialism. So I'm still working this out. Um, but I, I definitely think that, you know, um, be, first, in order to think like a geographer in a critical sense, one has to think relationally. And that means a, a number of things. One, it, it means that um, you have to get at this idea of space and time that often is differentiated that Candace, you were talking about um, before, I'm pointing to your square, but that you were talking about um, uh, before in, in relation to we need to struggle with time. To deal with space does not mean we strip time out, right? That there's this idea of material time that we need to sort of really think think through. And I think post qual has to, has to similarly struggle with this notion of imminence, um, which is the, like I said before, the sort of the, where history meets the present and is not yet determining the future. And so as we think through methodologically and philosophically, we have to address those, those uh, types of issues. I think also this sort of ethic towards political change in relation to injustice, the, the folks that I read in critical geography um, that resonate with me are very oriented towards um, mapping sort of a cartographer's view of uh, power relations and social relations in addition to sort of putting them within material um, uh, uh, relations, the sort of materiality of the map, um, <clears throat> but not being bound by that. So that maps, again, uh, uh, sort of leak right they don't they 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 don't contain actually all that well um uh, uh social interactions um <clears throat> or material interactions so that means that we have to attend to that type of leakage and i think the post qual folks would say something very similar about inquiry that it actually doesn't contain well we just pretend that it does it's a facade um so what we need to do is understand the way in which things are leaking out um not so that we can capture them but maybe that we can follow their trajectories. And I think critical geographers sort of do that really well, um, sort of that sort of following the, um, uh, the trajectories of power relations and the like, especially in education, right? You can look at, you can sort of take a critical geographic look at curricular structures um, and sort of follow, uh, follow their norms, follow the uh, logic that informs them and how that impacts something like the classroom that we're set up in. I taught a class on critical geography and inquiry and uh, started giggling because every time I would walk into the classroom, the students left the front of the room for, for me as the instructor because the technology was there, that the, that the desk was there or whatever. And I don't, I'm not great with technology. I like a whiteboard and I make a mess of it, right? I, but I'm not like doing a lot on it. And I just kept saying like, isn't it interesting that we're reading all this stuff and we're reinscribing sort of um, uh, power relations in this very room. That's how habitualized it is. Well, of course I'm the student, I should sit back here and leave that for this joker Aaron Kuntz to talk from, right? Of course I should, right? And there's even things like um, uh, people have talked about, you know, in the Victorian area and the like, and it comes to now that sort of having this idea of what does it look like to be a good student, right? Often it looks like this. And then writing, right? That, that there are these very learned embodied practices as we sit in the chair. I mean, I, I teach seminars that are three hours long and we're supposed to sit in this in the chair and ignore our bodies. And why? Because we're supposed to be all minds in the most drab rooms we can find on campus. They're khaki colored walls. There's nothing on the wall. And you're supposed to just sit there for three hours and listen and talk text and be like this and pretend that our bodies don't matter when we know it's really bad for backs, right? It's really bad for, and it's bad, frankly, for knowledge production. Instead, we should take walks, right? We should walk through our burritos. We should do yoga. We should do all these different types of things such that 
we're not just bounding ourselves by space because I think it bounds ideas. There's a link there. So I think there's post-qual and critical geographers would sort of that those ideas would resonate across the three. I think that's fascinating. As a former social studies teacher is actually how I got my start. I have to say that I am, I geek out over maps and have a globe, <laughs> um, but I always think of it as what you referenced, a partial knowing. So I think if we come to inquiry as here are the bounds of the way it is, then we've really done ourselves an injustice and done injustice for others as well. But one thing that struck me as you spoke about imminent is just how uh, the, the notion of imminent domain, yeah. it, it initially um, is what popped into my head. And so in so many of these concepts that we think with, there is, there is an, um, another perception that is more fixed. And I think of imminent domain and that idea that it's happening in the present, it's happening, that means it's done. Uh, yeah. So how do you affirmatively resist those notions when it comes to inquiry and education? I think you've spoke, spoken to that much, but yeah. if you have any more thoughts on that. Well, I think, you know, I really think this idea that things extend beyond what we know that we don't always recognize, right? I mean, I think this is this idea that I referenced before, which I think is a geographic, critical geographer's take on it, that space is leak, right? That you can't capture everything. The problem is that we think we can, right? The problem is that we talk about terms like triangulation or even crystallization and as though they were able to confine fully the human experience or the post-human experience, the relational experience, maybe we'll go there, right? Um, so then we have to ask, what are we missing and what are the consequences of that missing, right? We, I think we really have to, because I, again, to get back from where we started, like that is an ethical, those are ethical questions. What does it mean that we haven't um, engaged in this way or that we think that we haven't and other cultures, other perspectives, other et cetera, have been for centuries and now it's like, oh, now I'm, out of the table, hey, thanks, right? <laughs> right, that the, these, these mechanisms of exclusion that then become inclusion should also be suspect. Um, uh, so I think that this, this idea that you can't capture it, but to link back to the maps, since you, you like geek out of maps, which I think is fascinating, this idea of, I love the idea where the map, where the map maker gets to the edge of their knowledge and can no longer create the map and try to put something there. Um, I think others have talked about it in terms of weather maps. Like I think that I was paying attention to the weather last night because there were storms moving through Alabama and I still have, have, have uh, relatives and friends there. And the weather map is really interesting because it's always shifting and changing. And it's simultaneously representational and material um, because people are experiencing that world even as the Doppler effect is telling you where things are, right? So this is really interesting intersection. And it's a, I've, I've written about this before that I have, I'm, I'm from the Northeast so tornadoes are very new to me is weird to experience a tornado heading towards you because you start saying like, oh, go north, go north or go south. Well, the people north of you are saying, oh, go south, <laughs> go south, right? So there's like this ethic of like, okay, what does it mean to relationally endure weather in some ways? And now that I'm in Miami, this is, you know, here all the time, we're thinking through like, what, what does it mean to ethically engage with this um, place that is, you know, sea levels are rising, right? The, um, uh, uh, are we trying to manage the environment in an insustainable way or a sustainable way that is only sustainable for us? That's maybe not sustainable for other ecosystems, right? These are the questions. And so if you try to start mapping that, you necessarily have to come to the blurred edge of your knowledge and be okay with that. So then there's your entry, for me, there's your entry point, right? You come to that blurred end where the map kind of concludes, but you recognize there's more there. Now I have a responsibility to go at that, right? And to really try and understand my relation to it. And I think people have done it in brilliant ways. Um, uh, and I'm trying to always learn from them in that sense and to sort of take it on and write through it and, and, it's, and to struggle with it, to not pretend that I have it. That's the other thing that a higher education kind of teaches you this facade of like, I know it. No, we don't, we don't know it. The knowledge is not, it, things are exceeding our knowledge, which is a positive thing. Um, uh, so we need to engage with it differently. I'm afraid time is not on our side. Um, <laughs> the webinar's 
come to an end now because it's six o'clock our time here at night. I'm not sure what time it is for you. What is it? 11 o'clock. It's, it's noon on the East Coast. <laughs> I know. And for you, Candice? 11. And Michelle, okay. I don't know what time it is Ten. for you. 10. <laughs> 10 o'clock. And you, Erin Price? I'm through 11. Okay. Well, whatever time it is across the world, um, time is up. But I would just like to say a huge thank you to Erin and Michelle for your generosity it's been such a, a lively session and uh, such a generative session so thank you so much for for your time and for coming along we've really enjoyed it thank you thanks for having us this was great yeah, thank you so thank much thank you Take you're care. welcome